Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Cybos and to our panel, Sustainable Security Investment and Post-Trade Innovation. I'm Diana Poroshova Laoi. I'm a head of public policy and sustainable finance at Asia Security Industry and Financial Markets Association. I have the great pleasure to moderate this uh, first panel uh, today and have uh, some distinguished speakers uh, uh, next to me. So um, on my left, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Yifong So, who is the Global Head of Securities and Fiduciary Services, Cloud Management and Implementation, Global Transaction Services at DBS Bank. Good morning. Next to her, we have Mr. Jonathan Hackett, who is a co-head NBO Energy Transition Group and Head of Sustainable Finance. Good morning. Next to Jonathan, we have Ms. Lujie, who after long service in public uh, uh, authorities, is now joining as a Senior Director for China Central Depository and Clearing. And last but not least, we have Ms. Angie Walker, who is responsible for Capital Markets Strategy Business Development for Chainlink. Welcome, everyone. We have uh, only 60 minutes to unpack a great question. What is financial services uh, doing to help us all reach net zero uh, targets? And just a few weeks before COP29, uh, I think uh, we have tons of questions. So uh, let's begin. So, uh, Ifang, uh, over to you. Uh, what is DBS Bank doing in sustainability? What are your initiatives right now? Um, DBS Bank's approach towards sustainability is really to have a sense of purpose. Right? And uh, it's really imperative for us to do it in a way that is balanced and responsible. So um, we have designed three sustainability pillars. But before we do that, uh, I go into that. I'd like to just share some key milestones that we've achieved over the years. Right, DBS Bank was the first in Singapore to sign up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance in October of 2021. Uh, we were the first in Southeast Asia to publish a set of targets uh, for the scope three financed emissions uh, attributable to us as a bank. Um, and to support Asia's transition to a low carbon economy, we have also set decarbonization targets for seven sectors, mainly power, oil and gas, uh, aviation, automotive, shipping, steel and real estate. Um, and also started to look at data coverage for food, agri and chemicals so that we could set future emission targets uh, that is meaningful. Right. Um, and we really believe that sustainability is an active value driver for us to create long-term value for our stakeholders. So our three pillars uh, that, that drives our sustainability activities really is about, number one, responsible banking. Number two, responsible business practices. And number three, impact beyond banking. So when we started our sustainability journey about 10 years ago, uh, we focused on the basics, right? The sustainable loans, the sustainable uh, linked bond issuances where we were the book runner. Um, as we continue in this journey, we are setting more aspirational targets for ourselves. Uh, last year, we set up a project net zero to drive the operationalization of our climate agenda and with the objective of achieving net zero by 2050. And this is done through our lending and financing uh, businesses with our clients, our operations, and also setting uh, climate considerations in our risk management process throughout the organization. Okay. The second pillar that for us is really about responsible business practices. This really is about our commitment to our employees. How do we continuously enhance the employee's engagement and culture within the organization? How do we develop our people and drive diversity, equity, and inclusion? So some of the examples we've had, it's really around things like um, programs on employee mental well-being, especially coming out of COVID. I think that is a very important uh, aspect to help our staff and employees um, you know, get back into the momentum. Um, we continuously measure our employee engagement versus the best 
employers in APAC, right? And um, another example would be annual learning uh, week for career resilience for our employees and uh, a sustainable learning campus really to holistically uh, look at how do we dial up the awareness and the education on sustainability amongst our employees. And last but not least, a uh, women leadership program to, to drive diversity, uh, equality, uh, and equity and inclusion. Right. So these are just some examples uh, of, of how we've done uh, responsible business practices. And finally, the last pillar is about impact beyond banking. What is that? It's one that I think everyone can relate to. Uh, it's really working to blur the lines between making profit and also doing good for, for uh, the nation. Right? Uh, we have the, uh, set up DBS Foundation in 2014 to support and nurture social enterprises where these businesses can work towards a double bottom line, meaning committing to, prof, uh, to creating impact, improving lives and enabling change uh, through the grants and through any of the community programs that we may have. So our goal is um, to impact 8.4 million beneficiaries by 2027. As of last year, we've already had grants of uh, 17 million out to 140 social enterprises across the region. Um, the second part of uh, this impact beyond business is really about people of purpose. That is really our um, employee volunteerism, where employees actually uh, dedicate time for uh, you know the uh, volunteer hours in the underserved and the underprivileged. And our commitment is uh, to commit 1.5 million volunteer hours across the region for that. So in summary, DBS is really actively committed to sustainability, and we've made significant strides in the areas of responsible banking, employee practices, and community development. Our net zero uh, is goals are ambitious and will require close collaboration with our clients to achieve that success, while we work towards blurring the lines of making profit and doing good. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, indeed, we sometimes forget uh, how much uh, sustainability actually uh, involves. It's not just climate targets, it's yes. much, much more beyond this. So uh, maybe I turn to Li Jian. Uh, so how does your uh, C uh, CDCC uh, engage in sustainability and how do you help investors? Okay, uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to this section. Uh, I come from CCDC, China's Central Depository and Cleaning Company. Uh, we were founded in 1996 as a financial market instructor. So in the past 28 years, uh, we are committed to provide high quality post trade services to the bond market, which include the bond restriction, insurance, interest payment, cleaning, and collector, and also information disclosure. Also, we committed to promote the sustainable financial innovation. So uh, this time I bring uh, our menu to show you to the camera. Uh, sorry, I didn't put it on the slides, but it's a tree. Why I use a tree? Uh, you, you see that uh, I want to use a tree to represent our services. It was inspired, uh, inspired by a Chinese old saying that plant the buttonwood tree and the phoenix will come. It means that if the tree were planted well, more birds will come. Uh, resulting in a better world. As a financial market structure, we hope to plan a big tree of sustainable services to attract domestic and foreign institutions. Uh, so what kind of services are on this tree? Uh, the first part is the leaves. You see, the leaves means the uh, ESG data. You see that the foundation of the sustainable investment is standardized data. So we involve ESG data uh, with tens of thousands of entities and trillions of assets in the Chinese market. We also integrate a large amount of uh, unstructured and alternative uh, data. After data cleaning and uh, standardization, we provide multi-dimensional database to the market. 
So the second one is the ESG uh, investment tools. That will be the fruits of the tree. So based on the solid data I just mentioned, we develop a series of investment uh, tools or analysis tools, which include ESG rating, ESG indices, and also the carbon emission accounting tools. And um, with the support of, with the support of a grand range of the financial institutions, such as the banks, insurance companies, funds, and security firms, uh, these tools are widely used, uh, as the uh, asset management, risk management, uh, regulatory reporting, uh, information disclosure, or uh, low carbon transaction planning. That's the useful, uh, our tools. Uh, also, the third part is the one stop platform uh, is the branch of the tree. Uh, based on the real time uh, asset pricing benchmark we provided to the market, we integrate ESG data, rating, and also investment tools into the one platform. Uh, that's a kind of, we call it Dota Quant or DQ. It's a bond trading terminal. So you can imagine that uh, every day morning, in the morning, the a bond trader turn on his computer. But he will also turn on our terminal, the Dr. Quant. So he can get the whole uh, market information about bonds and securities by the Dr. Quant, and he will make the um, trading decision. Also, he will get ESG information from the Dr. Quant. So he can take ESG consideration uh, into consideration and also may make uh, trade uh, charges. So and I think that is the overview of our uh, services tree. But if you are really interested in with that, you can get the, our service manual uh, from our booth as on the first floor. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lin Jian. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, a lot of data and a lot of. Uh, uh, care is needed at central hubs so that uh, we can all uh, get uh, some reliable information and make sure that uh, the, the, what we're expecting that we're trading is actually what uh, what it is. So uh, maybe uh, Angie can continue on this topic. Uh, what do you do in uh, the sustainability field? What are your initiatives? Yeah, so sustainability is a really exciting area for chaining green have a number of areas in which we're able to service sustainability. So just to give a bit of perspective, maybe first, uh, we specialize in data oracles. So for those who don't know us, we, we have over a thousand decentralized data oracles around the world uh, in production today. And we also do a lot of work in proof of reserves. So that's not just around sustainability, it's also uh, relative to other asset classes as well, but proof of reserves are very important particularly to green instruments, and I'll cover that on some of the examples that I'm going to cite. And then uh, last but by no means least, interoperability. And interoperability is obviously incredibly important from a liquidity perspective. So we don't just want to think about issuing a green bond or issuing a carbon credit. We want to think about how do we facilitate the transfer of ownership of that asset from its primary investor uh, to, to the secondary markets, and we'll talk a little bit by examples where we're working on that as well. So we're very fortunate that we have some really incredible assets that are very relevant to sustainability. And uh, and so I'll give you a few little examples of things that we've done in the past um, or that are present and, and uh, active at the moment. So my, uh, I'll start with ANZ. Uh, ANZ is a, is a very strategic partner and customer of uh, uh, Chainlink. They are uh, incredibly innovative and uh, they launched a digital marketplace I think last year now, and uh, they're very worried about their reefs, not surprisingly, with things like coral bleach. I'm a passionate diver, so I care about coral bleach as well. And um, so they actually issued a uh, carbon credit, uh, a digital carbon credit, uh, reef credit, sorry, last year, and we issued it on Ledger, and we actually facilitated a full delivery versus payment uh, transaction for that um, reef credit. Uh, on, on Ledger, uh, and we were able to actually monitor the whole life cycle from the actual issuance of the reef credit all the way through to the investor. And that's really important because it means that we can then validate and verify that so we're able to uh, accommodate the biggest challenges around things like greenwashing, which is validating and verifying that the asset is what it says it is, 
it's in the quantity and the quality that we expect it to be and that the investor is investing in a, in a, a true green instrument. So the ANZ project was very important. We've also got a really interesting uh, partner of chaining uh, a company called Floodlight um, who do um, geospatial satellite imagery of um, I expect mainly around carbon emissions. Now, why this is super important is carbon emissions uh, are a very broad church. They span a wide variety of different sectors. And if you think of the most basic things like shipping, they're able to monitor with extreme accuracy um, the amount of carbon created by shipment from the point that it leaves the port all the way through to its final destination. And we're able to monitor that and bring that data on chain using data oracles. So that floodlight's a really interesting uh, project. And as I say, they can go from very large consignments of uh, uh, carbon emissions from shipping all the way right down to an individual building. And I'll give an example of why that's really important with things like um, corporate redevelopment uh, in order to reduce carbon emissions later on uh, in the conversation. But so floodlight's very, very interesting. And we're, we're collecting data through data oracles and using that to test um, the carbon emissions and the offsetting of those carbon emissions uh, on chains. So that's a really groundbreaking and very interesting use of the technology. Uh, and then uh, more recently, we've been uh, building out uh, an example of a demonstration, which we'll be showing on our stand. We'll be delighted if you can come and see us um, in, the, in the exhibition hall. We've built a green commercial paper demonstration for, for Cyboss, actually, and uh, it will show you the uh, full life cycle of green commercial paper from issuance of the individual uh, paper itself all the way through to the facilitation of payment. And just going back to the ANZ example, they did complete the entire life cycle with uh, the use of stable coins. So we actually used a stable coin on Ledger to facilitate for DVP. So uh, later on, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it, but what's very important is we're able to solve for both the verification of the underlying green instrument and the validation of that asset and the attestation of that as it continues its life. So if you think about the life of these instruments, it can be relatively short if it's commercial paper. If it's a bond, the typical life of, a, 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 of an ESG bond is around seven and a half years. And so what we're doing is we're monitoring the whole life cycle and we're testing not just at the beginning, but also during the life cycle. So it's very important where we combine the use of uh, smart contracts, uh, data oracles, and the attestation capabilities is typically delivered by an independent third party to attest that the uh, green instrument continues to meet its ESG uh, um, credentials or its ESG obligations during its life cycle. And we monitor that and we record that immediately to the ledger uh, of, the, uh, of the life cycle. So there's some very interesting things that we're doing not just in terms of verifying the asset, but also in validating it throughout its life cycle as well. So it's really exciting time for us. Indeed, uh, thank you so much, Angie. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great challenge to actually uh, monitor an investment throughout the whole cycle of the investment. So uh, it's interesting to see how technology is helping us with this. Uh, talking about data investments and uh, the role of all of us, uh, we probably have to take a step back and talk about definitions and how we define things. So. Uh, maybe Jonathan can elaborate uh, about the use of taxonomies and uh, where there are bottlenecks and where are we in this? Yeah, so if you're taking a step back, I think our goal in working with our clients around sustainable securities is to incentivize capital into these projects, into the places where we need to spend money in order to create a more sustainable future. You know, for green instruments, that is really looking at projects that either reduce emissions, create resilience, remove carbon from the atmosphere, things that are having a positive impact. But the challenge that we have is that the use of taxonomies around the world has really emerged for two dual and I believe competing purposes. One is to give assurance to investors that things are what they say they are and aligned to the goals of the investors. And for some investors, that is to avoid things they don't like. If you think about where responsible investing really started, a lot of it was around exclusionary mandates, people that didn't like oil and gas, people that didn't like nuclear, people that didn't like other you know, things that they considered objectionable. 
where we are today is we're also using these taxonomies around a positive lens, around where we need capital in order to drive the energy transition. For some things, that's completely aligned. You know, if you say, should a green instrument contain oil and gas exploration? My answer is no. For some, it's highly conflicted. You know, we led the first nuclear green bond for a client, and part of that was because there was this debate, which doesn't feel nearly as much like a debate today, but going back five years, there's a strong debate around the role of nuclear as part of the energy transition. And so one of the challenges we have is that we have these taxonomies that have been created in different jurisdictions that are trying to solve both these problems at the same time, and also are highly regionally focused on the needs for the transition in those regions. And so when we think about interoperability, when we think about securities, we have to think about these different demands and ask the question of what's the right taxonomy to use when you're issuing a bond, say in Europe, but for an issuer that might be in Southeast Asia. Is it to say we're going to find some common ground, we're going to use the minimal intersection of those different taxonomies? Well, that actually excludes most of the activities that are necessary for the transition outside of a highly mature economy, because Europe's taxonomy is really grounded in the needs of the European economy. And you can argue whether or not it's even satisfying that given the almost detransition of certain economies in Europe. But the goals of those transition taxonomies or those green taxonomies really are conflicting. And so we need to find ways to allow comfort. And so the, the benefit of taxonomies is they give you a language. They give you a reference point that allows you to say, does this check the box? But I think one of the key challenges is that we need to avoid the presumption that you can satisfy every taxonomy at once or that the right taxonomy to satisfy is the jurisdiction where you're actually going to put the instrument. Because at a certain point, we need to focus on getting the flows of capital to the right places where it's going to drive an impact. And a lot of times that means that the best next dollar spent is not where all of the money is in the world today. Uh, that's a very good point, and uh, the debate about uh, which taxonomy you have to satisfy, it's endless. I represent uh, uh, a SIGMAN, we have 170 members, all multinationals, and for them it's actually a big question, uh, should they follow the uh, headquarters uh, uh, regulation and uh, definitions, or should they follow the regulations of the countries that they're making the investments? And because financial flow has to go around the world, it's a very difficult question to answer indeed, yeah. 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 So uh, maybe back uh, to you, since we're talking about instruments and green bonds and, uh, um, and uh, sustainability link bonds, Ninja, uh, uh, how do you facilitate uh, uh, this agenda here in China? Uh, it means uh, certain link bonds. Yes. Yeah, yes. we are paying attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but I want to that just you mentioned that the testimony and also the authorization and interoperability, I think it's a very big problem. Right? I think in recent years that international standards for uh, information, uh, sustainability information disclosure, uh, you also already has been uh, coming convergence towards consistency like ISSB, uh, TCFD, NGI, and domestic authorities have also introduced many Mm, policies that support sustainable financial practice. So, however, ESG investment, I think, will face a big challenge, which include inconsistent data, a low consistency, uh, also scattered data sources, and lack of transparency. I think mm, since ESG information involves different stakeholders in the long value chain, we should work together to improve the sensation. Uh, interoperability of ES data cross border, also for the SLB, uh, the definition text only. <laughs> that will help the investor to move smoothly. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, um, maybe we we'll get back to uh, the banking sector then. Uh, even there is so much uh, um, speculation about what AI can do for us. So, how do you use uh, AI to kind of stimulate this? Yeah, um, at DBS, uh, We've been embracing AI since uh, 2014, right? That was our first foray into uh, IBM Watson. And um, since then, we've had uh, two other major um, activities to explore that. Um, and I think we were probably, the technology at that point in time was just not 
ready for the, the requirements that we are looking for. Uh, whether it's a natural language processing, it's not ready, or, or the use cases just couldn't get us to the level that we require. Right. So, um, but I think things have changed. Technology has improved. And uh, our goal is really um, to look for use cases and um, establish a deployment framework. Because what is important is that we need to protect the data of the bank. And yes, and find ways to democratize the use of data. And yet at the same time, uh, ensure that um, it is kept safe. Um, so having a flexible technology platform to help us get there. And the operating model implications, right? Um, AI being AI, and especially Gen AI, there is also this thing about hallucination. So how do we get there? So our goal is um, put in guardrails and identify pilot use cases first. Uh, we did that last year. This year, we are looking to focus on prioritizing personas, right? Looking at it from a co-pilot perspective, like a co-worker, uh, a digital twin of sorts that will mirror um, a, an, an actual person, right? Um, and embed the, the guardrails into the process, into the system. And then um, from 2025 onwards, then we will look at hyperscaling um, and how do we ensure that the performance is, is up to speed and up to par and look at um, co-worker for everyone. So in short, right, in our horizon one is to enable Gen AI as a co-pilot, identify the opportunities where we could allow Gen AI to run alongside our employees. Uh, in Horizon 2, leveraging Gen AI to potentially, potentially eliminate the maker role. And what we have identified is three areas in processing. Right? Uh, one is pre-processing, especially when we get a lot of non-standard uh, instructions, whether is it in a, a fax format, in a MT199 or T599 formats. How do we leverage the technology to identify the type of document and extract the actual data from that document and embed it into our core system uh, and detect from there the potential anomalies that could go wrong, right? And then that's the step one. Step two would be really on processing checks, checking that the data is being processed against a predefined set of rules because you, you don't want it to go wrong, right? And um, use it as an escalation mechanism or an exception mechanism. And point three would be post-processing checks. Post-processing would be along the lines of reconciliation, QA checks, uh, optimizing fraud detection, hopefully, and uh, workflow analysis. So what we have done specifically in the, uh, the security services area is, uh, and I hope that it will go live by the end of this year, is to look at workflow, which are very manual, corporate action. We get corporate action feeds from all over, whether is it from the exchange or from, uh, you know, feeds. Um, how do we then look at the narratives that may go into multiple pages uh, and the complexity and pull out the necessary information from the, the corporate action, digest it into the system and regurgitate it into a form that our checkers can check. So, in other words, we're transforming the roles of our employees from a uh, maker checker to a digital core maker and a checker. Who knows, right? Um, if Gen AI and technology improves, we, we don't know how else the roles will change. Indeed, uh, actually, uh, Goldman Sachs published a report, I think, last year on the impact on employment. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, if we uh, deploy AI in banking sector and the figures were staggering. So it's really interesting how quick this, uh, uh, this whole transformation will yes. develop.
yeah. and how we're going to have to all redefine our roles yeah. and find a, a new meaning and a new kind yes. of value added in the whole process. Yes. So super interesting, not only in the ESG and sustainability context, but more, more broadly. That's why in yeah. our ESG role, mm. we actually uh, put a lot of emphasis on our employees to train and retrain and reskill. Yeah, it's it's definitely an opportunity, absolutely. So, um, Angie, uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the technologies that you're using to verify and to, to follow the processes and investments. Sure, um, I'm so, I'm going to do an example on a, a, of a, how it would work from beginning from beginning of the journey to the end. But I want to give an example, and I can, I was sort of torn between the reef credit thing, which I feel very passionate about. But I want to talk about something in the corporate world, which is probably very relevant to the bond, to particularly in the bond world. So if we think about um, carbon emissions and uh, and we think about, uh, the, I'm going to use the analogy, or use the terminology dirty factory, please forgive me for saying this, um, but if we look at a dirty factory, and there's plenty of them around, and we've got certainly plenty of them in the United Kingdom, I can tell you, but the reality is a lot of these organisations, corporates, require very significant investment in order to uh, basically refurbish and transform what are you know, uh, uh, real estate which might date back 50 years. We, we're pulling down you know, very large chimney stacks in the United mm-hmm. Kingdom that represent coal-fired plants uh, that date back 50, 60 years. So let's say we're a corporate, we want to raise a bond in order to uh, refurbish a, an industrial site um, then for us, the, the example that I'm going to cite here is where we would not only um, be I- involved in potentially the creation of the smart contract that, it, that allows them to instantiate the bond uh, on the ledger as, as a sort of a, a, a native instrument on the ledger. So we're creating a smart instrument or a smart bond uh, that represents the, 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 the actual programme of work of refurbishment from the very beginning. And that bond is going to last probably five or ten years. They're going to have to raise a lot of money, whether that's 50 million, 100 million, to refurbish at a corporate level a site. But in order to reduce its carbon emissions, probably quite dramatically um, over the course of that time. Now, in the past, what would happen is that would all be done on paper. And there is no real way of um, uh, Ryan, my colleague, cited an example where instead of spending the money on their uh, carbon emissions on refurbishing the site, they spent it on gold toilets. Or well, maybe I won't use that as the perfect analogy of how things might go wrong. But it, you have no proof in the existing world have they actually spent that money on the thing that you wanted to spend it on. So if you think about managing the life cycle of that asset or that debt uh, as an instrument natively on the ledger, what we're now able to do through data oracles, through attestation on the, during the ongoing life cycle, we can not only check and verify that the original debt is being used for the right purpose. So let's say they're raising 50 or 100 million as a green bond, um, which there will be a program of work. And what we're able to do is through um, geospatial type uh, monitoring, we're able to monitor the carbon emissions of that site very accurately over the course of the life of the bond. So what we can actually do is monitor have they achieved their goals against that loan in refurbishing that site. So it's not just about the uh, uh, origination of the smart contract at the very beginning, which of course carries all of this data around what was the programme of work, what were the end uh, objectives of that particular programme of work, and what are the milestones that we meet along the way in order to achieve those goals. Um, but we're also able to use external data to verify that they've met the milestones across that journey. We're also able to use external attestation providers to, to, to ensure that during that the life of that debt, that the, the original um, issuer of that debt has uh, achieved their um, goals in meeting the attestation of the debt during the life cycle, so there may be periodic uh, checks to ensure that they've got to the point at which they said they would get to during the refurbishment of that of that particular site. And then when we get to the end of the, uh, uh, of the process, have we actually met the goals of reducing the carbon emissions in relation to that site? So what we're able to do is through a combination of 
data oracles, external attestation, and the external attestation is very important to pretty much all uh, ESG instruments. It's got to be independently verified that this instrument is meeting its objectives during the course of its life. Otherwise, an e what started life as an ESG instrument could well uh, become not an ESG instrument um, very quickly if you're not monitoring its uh, progression to ensure that it's meeting its objectives. So what we're doing is we're combining as a, quite a few things that are being combined together here. We're combining the use of smart contracts to drive the life cycle and to drive any actions and obligations during the course of the life cycle. And that could include payments as well, particularly if it's a bond, we can actually drive the, 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 the interest payments directly from the ledger. And that could be cross chain to the beneficiaries of the invest, who've invested in that bond. Uh, we're using attestation externally to ensure that the bond continues to meet its objectives during its life cycle. And again, super important because we're trying to eliminate the sphere of greenwashing, which has dogged the industry for the last five or 10 years. And we've got to get away from that and be able to show that we can use technology to solve for that problem. And then we're using the immutability of the ledger and we're using external uh, information to verify and validate that during the course of that, the life of that instrument, that they've actually met their objectives. And then at the very end, of course, you've got things like the geospatial capabilities of things like the, of uh, services like Floodlight to say, well, has this corporate uh, initiative for refurbishment actually met its own objectives? Is its own carbon emissions reduced to the level they aim to, to get to? And again, we're able to collect that data and to validate that data and immediately record it onto the ledger. So for anybody investing, so if I'm sitting here and I'm investing in a green bond or I'm investing in a fund that has that green bond in it, I now have complete confidence that not only is it what it, what it says it is, but during its life cycle, did it meet its own objectives of being an ESG instrument? Did it, did it, did it qualify for the level of certification it's achieved? And also at the end, did it, did it meet the overall objective of reducing carbon emissions in relation to that site? And I think if we can give people using the technology and chainlink has been doing this for a number of years, we've been, you know, we are, uh, data oracles is uh, 101. We've got over a thousand decentralized data oracles uh, in production today. But the combination of that and the proof of reserves and the attestation and then the immutability of that over the life of the bond, I think will hopefully start to bring confidence to the market that these assets are assets that are worth investing in. And if you look on the buy side, there's a massive push towards green, you know, large number of the buy sides are now saying that any of the instruments it takes into its portfolios have to be green. And so this, this ability to use technology to give people confidence that we can eliminate these challenges around the governance, around the credibility of these instruments is, is really important because the buy side is, has an appetite to want to invest, to want to be able to use these assets, but we've got to show as an industry that they are, they are, they are what they say they are, and they continue to be what they say they are throughout their life cycle. So it's a, it's a really interesting time where we, we're proving the technology can do that and hopefully the confidence will come. Indeed, the question of confidence is uh, super important right now because uh, most of the major financial institutions have uh, their own net zero commitments and they're being held responsible to meeting them. They have made their transition plans and now they're uh, facing the challenge to prove how they're progressing. And in order for this proof to be uh, substantiated, they need uh, people like you to help them actually track and make sure that if this asset sits in my portfolio, does it continue to meet the, <clears throat> the, uh, the criteria that I first put it in there? So it's a long process. We forget that this is not a one of action. It's a process that takes several years, which makes it very, very complex. So, um, no doubt that technology has a huge role to play, but the, the, the question of trust, confidence, integrity, is very, very important. And to have one last point, and that is it's not just the primary market, exactly. it's the secondary market. So exactly. a lot of people, people tokenize assets all the time. Mm -hmm. What they don't think about is how do I get to the secondary market? The secondary market is as important, particularly longer term debt, where you're doing a very long and potentially quite complex program of investment. 
you've got to be able to allow for that free flowing of those assets to secondary market participants. And so the interoperability piece is going to become increasingly important the more and more of these longer term instruments we see come to market. And so we, we are trying to make sure we've accommodated the interoperability between the primary issuance and the chains or uh, existing platforms of, the, of those that want to invest from a secondary market perspective as well. It's really important because it's not just about the primary market. Exactly. If we want to have the liquidity and the money flow, uh, we need to secure yeah. this across the market. So absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, maybe now, uh, Jonathan, I uh, think that something that we haven't touched upon yet, uh, carbon credits. Um, we know this question about how legitimate carbon credits are, which of them are, which of them hold the integrity that we need to, uh, is still um, open. Uh, I think we'll see what uh, the next COP will conclude on this, but we know that uh, the question is still uh, up in the air. So what do you expect to happen in short and mid term in terms of carbon credits and how we can use these instruments? So it's funny, as I think about BMO's on own journey in carbon credits, you know, it's a space that we operated in for over a decade, offsetting our own emissions, procuring carbon removal credits from people with early stage technologies. And then eventually now we've, you know, partnered or acquired a company called Radical that does carbon credit advisory, carbon credit development, and are able to work across the full value chain. And I think the joke to me is that along the way, at one point, we talked about our environmental commodity strategy. And in a lot of ways, that's the goal, is that these are commodities. And if I think about so much of sustainable finance, we talk about PPA, power purchase agreements, as the most impressive financial technology that has driven the energy transition, because that has allowed the flow of capital into renewables at a pace that is unfathomable if you go back 20 years. Um, and it truly is an impressive technology. It is a tool for allowing the flow of capital. To correct myself of it being the most impressive tool, commodification is actually probably the single greatest financial technology humanity has ever come up with. It is the ability for us to say, it doesn't matter if that pig died, if I owe you a pork belly, I can still fulfill my contract because the death of the economy is not actually, you know, a failure of a bunch of these contracts is actually the cause of the fault of all the participants. And when we think about the risks we have in the carbon space, the real challenge is that we're asking people to do new things. We're asking them to do things without all of the tools that we have normally in finance. And then if something goes wrong, you're out. You're going to default. You're unable to deliver into a contract. And so when we see carbon contracts right now, when we see people engaging in off takes, I, sometimes it feels like a cruel mimicry of the real financial markets because you get these contracts and it's like, by the way, if you can't deliver, don't worry about it. You know, like it, it's like, well, it's, it's a take or pay contract, but also if you don't deliver it, we're not going to crush you. We don't want to break your dreams. You don't want to own your company by accident because we're a very large software company that makes windows and you're some guys trying to dehydrate wood at a really good technology. It's against the intention. The challenge we have is that that commodification is what allows us to do everything, right? If we don't have a commodity, it's really not very useful to engage in a whole bunch of these securities. And so you say, well, what can we do? Today, carbon is a commodity in the same way that wine is a commodity, which is it's only a commodity if you agree that somebody can deliver whatever they want into the contract. Whether that be you say, hey, look, I like reds, give me whatever red. And if somebody wants to give you a 2022 like Malbec, or a 1989 Barolo, those are the same thing. If you're on the other end, you probably don't feel those are the same thing. Um, and so the question is, how do we get from where we are to a functional market that allows us to have securities around it? And I think some of that is about the slower process of commodification. It's not just saying everything is a ton, is a ton, is a ton, is a ton, because that misrepresents how carbon is purchased today. Carbon is not purchased on a per ton dollar in basis. It's purchased in either a somewhat modified space where you don't really care and you want a ton, or it's purchased on a base that looks like direct private investment, where you're saying, what are the returns necessary for your project? Where do I think that technology or that solution space is going to get to? And what returns am I allow willing to give you in order for you to engage in that project? And so that means you can have $200 biomass energy with carbon kept in storage. You can have a $1,000 direct air capture. On all of those things are right. 
just in a different way. And so what we're working with our clients towards is how do you have deliverable baskets, things that meet these criteria, things that can be a set of parameters that'll allow you to have these contracts that'll allow us to bring the tools of finance into this space. But it really is challenged today by that two speed purchasing me mechanism, essentially the tell me what you need and I'll pay you for it versus the, this is what it really is uh, as a substitution on the abatement of carbon. And we need to find solutions to allow acceptance of substitution. The idea that if you don't deliver this, here is something else you can buy spot on the market to allow you to go over in. And one of those things it'll do to, to go back to what Andrew was saying before is pull in the secondary market because the, the myth that exists today is that there is a secondary market for carbon. And there kind of is, but all of it requires a tied proof as to what you're doing to catalyze the technology. Because a carbon removal credit today isn't actually valuable for its role today. It's valuable for the market that it creates in the future. And if somebody's already bought it, we need to help people to see that there's a reason that the purchase of a secondary carbon credit because it can allow somebody to fulfill these contracts, it can allow this financing to happen, is actually just as impactful as being the person that goes, partners with this project in whatever place in the world, gets a glossy photo in your annual report and says, see, I, I put my money here, this made it happen. That actually secondary purchases with the right tools, with the right parameters around it are just as catalytic because they allow us to bring the full spectrum of financial technology to make these projects happen and take financing rates down from 13%, 18% to 8 and 6%, achieve what we achieved on solar and allow capital to flow into the development of carbon removal, carbon capture, carbon avoidance projects at a pace that matches what we need in the world. Indeed, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a very good point. And you started with the, uh, describing carbon credits as uh, commodities and actually that's a very good analogy uh, however as you know not in all jurisdictions and not everybody treats carbon credits as commodities and if you take them as commodities then this would imply that there is a common price and uh, some commonalities in these carbon credits which is still lacking and this is the actual problem which you're describing at primary market we have people engaged in these projects and investing in them Actually, most of our members, the big banks and the big investors, they do uh, champion and they do invest in specific projects so that they can verify and they can make sure that these projects uh, tick the criteria that they deemed appropriate. But then the secondary market is altogether uh, another story because my criteria are not the same like your criteria. And we actually want to have a global commodity market of carbon, which will help us price carbon because market mechanisms do work on the basis of price uh, and uh, will help us also uh, invest in all these new technologies that will help us uh, uh, decarbonize. So it's it's, uh, it's a very complex story as you describe it and uh, uh, by, far, by far it's not over yet and uh, we're still uh, waiting to see which will bring this resolution to, to allow this market mechanism to work, to work on a global scale versus on different pockets. Yeah. Indeed. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and if questions come, uh, we will address uh, the panelists. And uh, in the interim, maybe um, since we have a few minutes, uh, we go around uh, the table and uh, we talk a, a little bit about what you see as the biggest challenge right now, and what do you think COP29 or the governments or industry should be focusing to address? If you are right next to me, may I start with you? <laughs> Um, I think in the, um, the securities uh, industry that we are in, um, what I've seen is that there is a lot of activity and motivation to actually digitize. However, the, the industry is very complex. It's, it's a, an industry that is for many, many years. In order to, for us to get the productivity out of all these investments, it's, uh, it takes a lot of effort to ensure that we actually find the right project to extract productivity. Because if it's not productivity, then it has to be revenue growth, right? Nothing is for free. Um, and, um, I think 
the whole chain of security services is still not in that state where we could generate the best productivity out of it. But I am hopeful because I think the fact that we are willing to start means that we'll get there. Right? It's in the meantime, how do we keep the momentum going and how do we keep the investments coming? Indeed, yeah. Indeed, we started, so whatever is ahead of us will go through it somehow, yes. but uh, indeed. Jonathan, would you like to address this question as well? Yeah, as, as I think the COP29, the thing that I'm most focused on is, I, I don't want to just say Article 6, because it's not just about the clarifications around how we'll have carbon moving globally and the ability for people to really access the marginal cost of abatement across the world to make an impact. But I actually think beyond that, it's the commitment of the parties involved. I think we've seen a real questioning of, you know, how aligned different countries are to one and a half to two degrees even. And what it creates is this uncertainty that changes investments. You know, if you think about investments in decarbonization of natural gas, a lot of investors are putting essentially a penalty on the potential investments that really is the uncertainty on policy of, you know, why would I bother with abatement if I think that it's possible there'll be a reversal of policy of, you know, constraints within this space. And that uncertainty and the delay of investments that it causes has a massive penalty when you think about the part where, you know, it's not just the trajectory of carbon down to zero, it's the area under that curve that represents the debt that we have that is going to take drawdown that is going to take drawdown in the future, that is going to have an impact on the climate that we experience over the next 30 years. And so every year of delay, you know, whether you believe it costs two at the end or whether you believe it just is a debt that we're going to have to repay in hard cost of uh, removal in the future is extraordinarily expensive. And so that uncertainty is costing us a massive amount in, in, in today's economy. A uh, very good point. Uncertainty does cost us money and we tend to forget that by 2030 we only have a few years left. Yeah. And this, you know, you know, kind of from a financial point of view is, is not such a long uh, period of time. So if money haven't been allocated yet, though, uh, this is going to make it very difficult to, to achieve this target. So it's a very valid point. Uh, yeah, uncertainty. So, Minjie, what do you think from your perspective are the challenges faced now? Yes, I think um, compared with the traditional investment, which focus more on the uh, financial performance, there's great difference for uh, the investor to uh, put money to the uh, carbon, uh, low carbon transaction or ESG investing. So, as the um, domestic infrastructure, uh, national infrastructure, we should do more about to uh, complying with the international convention. And to work more on the uh, standardization and uh, common testimony, I think that will help to the uh, investor to uh, do the job. Indeed, yeah, we have to work towards uh, common goals. Yeah, yes, indeed. Angie, you have the final word. <laughs> <Thank you> very <laughs> much. <laughs> um, well, there's some very interesting points that have been made. I think the standardization is absolutely vital to the industry. So for uh, the whole of the ESG industry as a whole, I think the standardization has got to come. It's As you said, it's there is no standardization, therefore we have no fungibility, which means that it's very difficult for us to create secondary markets if you can't have fungible instruments, then they can only basically trade in one place. So I think the standardization is absolutely key. Um, I think through the work that we're doing at the moment, I think if we can start to prove, and I mean, Shane is very passionate about ESG, we've spent a lot of time working on ESG, we do a lot of work with data oracle providers, we do a lot of work in the attestation space. When you consider there's a huge appetite on the buy side to invest in green instruments, in ESG-based instruments, I think if we can start to gain consumer confidence through things like proof of reserves, through things like attestation, I think the opportunity for a much broader spectrum of green instruments to come to market and to be managed in terms of their whole life cycle on ledger, cross chain, between chains and traditional technology, I think that will start to bring the market together in a much more healthy way than it is at the moment. I, I think there's also an opportunity for um, a whole variety of new ESG instruments around funding for things like solar, you know, making it much more accessible, making the funding 
much more accessible. So almost like democratising the funding, really. And again, that's all about giving confidence around uh, whether or not we, these instruments are suitable for use within the debt markets. And I think by eliminating this issue around the validation and the verification, which we can do, and we can prove that empirically, we've already done that. And there's a growing number of ESG projects that we're working on that clearly show that we can manage not just uh, the verification and validation of the origination and the instantiation of the asset onto the ledger, but we can also verify and validate the authenticity of that project and that instrument over time, then I think we'll bring more opportunity for uh, funds to be raised, whether that's in the corporate world or whether that's in other parts of the capital markets infrastructure to allow us to drive other ESG-based programmes. So I think if we can prove the technology is capable of eliminating the fear that customers have that if they're investing in an ESG instrument, is it what it says it is? That's obviously the first challenge. Does it remain an ESG instrument throughout its life? And, um, and as importantly, did it meet its final objective? And we can show empirically we can solve for all of those problems and we do today. And then if we can standardise both the instruments, the taxonomy, as Jonathan said, and also standardise uh, and achieve fungibility, and we can link the markets together, then we're able to start to create a true uh, secondary market. And I know that's not a trivial, and I know that requires a certain amount of liquidity, but if we start to standardise now, when we issue these new instruments, then it gives us a chance to start to build the liquidity between the various jurisdictions, which today we don't have. It's a very fragmented market, as you know. So technology is there. We're happy to demonstrate it. Please come to our stand and we'll show you green commercial paper, delivery versus payment from the beginning of its life to its very end. And hopefully that will give people the confidence to start investing, you know, in a more industrialised way in these types of instruments. Because I think the market is, is what craving ESG instruments, but we just we need to give them some more confidence. Indeed, it's all down to human will. At the end of the day, technology cannot solve our problems. So um, thank you all for joining me today. I think that was a great conversation.